nothing but heartaches and trouble. I was seeking for fortune, fame. I had nothing but doubts and confusion. But now I have everything. One more time with that verse, please. I had nothing but heartache and trouble. I was seeking for fortune and fame. I had nothing but doubts and confusion. But now. I have Jesus to show me the world. He has saved me and gave me life eternal. Save me 
Thank the Lord that now we have everything. Amen. Come on, give the Lord one more hand clap of praise. Thank you, singers and musicians. I love that song. That's my story. That is my story. Now I have everything. If you have your Bibles here this morning, turn with me to the book of James. It's right after the book of Hebrews. The epistle of James, chapter 1, beginning in verse 2, James writes and says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. I had a title originally scheduled or planned for this message, but just a few minutes ago, I kind of felt prompted in my spirit to change it. And the title that I want to use for this morning's subject is I've come too far to look back. I've come too far to look back. Come on, church, I've come too far to look back. I've climbed mountains, I've crossed rivers, desert streams, yes, I know, but I'm nearing the home shore. The redeemed are rejoicing. Heaven's angels are singing. I've come too far to look back. Praise God. Would you pray with us today? Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your grace, your mercy. And Lord, I pray this morning that you would anoint us as we minister your word. We cannot do without the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray that that faith would be strengthened here this morning, that those who are on the verge of giving up, that they would have a fresh touch of God to get up and to keep going forward, to know that we've come too far to look back. And we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Well, that's, that'll preach right there. Come too far to look back. Somebody asked me some time back, why do you use stories or illustrations at the beginning of many of your messages? When they asked me, I responded and I said, you know, I, as a, just for me personally, I learn more from illustrations when somebody utilizes an illustration, it helps me to understand what is being said. And I've taken that and I use that just about every time I stand before each and every single one of you. And this morning will be no different. There is a story that I came across that ties in to what we are going to be ministering on this morning. Many of you may not be familiar with 
an African-American woman by the name of Wilma Rudolph. Some of you, that name is unfamiliar. You've never heard of that name before. I had neither until I came across this story. She was born in 1940, Clarksville, Tennessee. She was the 20th child of 22 children. The 20th. She spent much of her childhood sick. She had scarlet fever, double pneumonia, and because of her sickly condition, her immune system was weakened to the point that she contracted polio. Now you think about this, a child, scarlet fever, double pneumonia, and now polio. Most in her condition would probably say, this is my lot in life. It'll never change. It'll never get better. But even as a child in Clarksville, Tennessee, she had a determination and she told her family, you see, she couldn't walk without leg braces. Contracting that disease, polio, she couldn't walk without these braces. So she told her family, I am going to walk without these braces. Just you watch. I'm sure they probably looked at her and thought, that's probably just child's, a child's dream. But year after year would go by, and she had something in her mind, a determination to not give up. That even though she may have had experienced some, some difficulties in life, she might have taken one step forward and yet taken two steps back. But yet as a child, she would not quit. She had it in her mind, I'm going to beat this. I'm going to walk without these leg braces. Fast forward to the age of 12. The age of 12, after years of toil and struggle, she told her family, it's time. She removed her leg braces, and she began to walk without the assistance of her leg braces. Her family looked at her and said, I can't believe this. And yet, as the days and months and weeks and the years grew by, went by, she became stronger and stronger and stronger, and she fell in love with track, running. Now, you think about this. She hadn't really run as a child, so she's making up for lost time as a teenager and young adult. And so she had began this, this love, this passion of track and field, of running, of sprinting, and it earned her the ability to go to college, Tennessee State. Her coaches looked at her and worked with her and thought to themselves, we've got something special and someone special on our hands. She contracted, once again, let's, let's think about this, scarlet fever, double pneumonia, polio, and now she's running track. Come on now. She's running track. And all of this caught the eyes of her coaches, and they told her, you have a shot at the Olympics if you work hard. You think about this. She caught the eye of the Olympic Games. She was invited, and she earned a spot as an Olympian in the 1960 Olympics. Now, that's something to get excited about. It is something that's, that's remarkable, but the story doesn't end there. All this time, as she began to work toward her goal, of being an Olympian, running for the gold medal, representing her country in Rome in 1960. The day before her race, she was training. 
Her coaches were there. Friends were there, and yet here she is training. Less than 24 hours to go before she is entering into her first race as an Olympian. And something happens. During her training session, she injures herself. And it wasn't just an injury. This was one of those injuries where you thought, I'm not sure if she could even make it. She messed up her ankle. And if you know anything about sports, an ankle is very important to have as, as an athlete. All your weight is on your ankles. And especially if you're a runner. And if you cannot put any weight or pressure on that ankle, you can't run as you should. You cannot function as you should. As an athlete, I know. I know what it's like to go through games injured with an ankle injury or injuring it in the middle of a game to where your, your ankle rolls over and you see the word Nike imprinted. That hurts. That's not fun. And that's exactly what happened. And here she's laying on the ground, devastated, coaches devastated, thinking that you need to just go ahead and call it a day. Maybe you can come back in the next four years and try it again. She said, no. I've come all this way. I've worked too hard. I've trained too much. I've overcome, I've overcome so many odds. I'm not quitting when, the la when I can see the proverbial finish line right before me. I'm not quitting right now. I'm not giving up right now. They said, just wait till the next day. We'll reevaluate. We'll look at it. We'll see. The next day came. They looked at her. They said, we're not sure if you should compete. She said, I'm competing. But you don't, you don't understand. You're injured. I know I am. But you don't know what I've come through. You don't know the odds that have already been stacked against me. You don't know what I've already overcome. This sprained ankle is nothing compared to what I've already come through. Mm. She said, wrap it up as tight as you can. She hobbled her way over to the starting block, barely putting any weight or pressure on that ankle. The coaches once again asked her, are you sure? She said, positively. I'm not quitting, not giving up. She put herself on that starting block, focused, determined, ready for the sound of that gun. Everyone lined up, and as that moment came, that starting gun blasted, and she took off in pain. 11.3 seconds later, she crosses the finish line. And yet everyone else was behind her. She not only finished first place, but she tied a world record. Come on now, church. She tied a world record. 11.3 seconds in the 100-meter dash. Not only that, she was the first American woman to win three gold medals at that Olympics event. The first woman ever in American history to place first place in three different events. And you think about that and you say, how does that apply to what I'm going through now? Well, let me just help you and just say this. Every one of us, we were born with the deck stacked against us. Because of sin, the deck was stacked against us. But somehow we found Jesus, or Jesus found us. And yet even through this Christian experience, the devil has set his sights on you to destroy you. He's knocked you down. He's knocked you over. He's told you it's through. He's told you you can forget it. But I've come to tell you this this morning. Church, whenever the devil comes and knocks you down, you get up and you tell the devil, devil, I've come too far to look back. I've come too far to look back. Boy, I wish 
wish somebody in here would get that. I've come too far to look back. I've come through the trials. I've come through the tribulations. I've come too far to give up now. Listen to what James says. James tells us, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. I want you to highlight that word when. If you have a pen, pencil, highlighter, or if you're using your iPad, your phone, your tablet, highlight that word when. What's so important, that word when? He didn't say if you fall into diverse temptations. He said when. That means that trials and tribulations are a guarantee. These trials that you will face as a believer, they will come. Even though I have stated this before, there's always new listeners and new viewers watching. And so I will repeat it for them. Satan is not satisfied or is not happy that you have walked away from him and found a new master in Christ. He's not happy with that. And because of that, he has set his sights on you to destroy or weaken your faith. Every attack that comes against you as a Christian is not so much against you personally, but is against your faith. It is against your faith because Satan does not want you. you to succeed he does not want you to make it he doesn't want you to finish this course he wants to trip you up every every step that you that, that you take he wants to get to the point to where he tries physically emotionally spiritually to destroy you to weaken you but James says count it all joy but you don't understand, Pastor Gabe. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know the hell that I'm facing. You don't know the junk that I've had to endure. You don't know what I'm facing at this moment. The hardships, the heartaches. I feel like just everything is against me. I feel like the weight of the world is on my shoulders. Or I feel at times like the rug has been pulled out. And everything has come crashing down around me. You don't know what I'm facing. No, I may not. But you don't know what I'm facing either. We're all facing something. We're all facing something. There is something that is before us, looking down at us, taunting us, wanting to destroy your faith. But we can count it all joy for this reason. Because when we face that giant... When we face that trial, when we face that situation and that tribulation, understand this. God is not going to let you die by yourself. He's not going to let you go. In other words, I'll say it better this way. Understand that God is not through with me. That whatever I'm going through, God is still in control. You see, too many Christians, when they face that wilderness experience, like the children of Israel, they were delivered by God with a mighty hand. And in, in a journey that should have taken two years through a wilderness to get to the promised land, it took 40. Why? Because of unbelief. Too many Christians, when they go through that wilderness experience or they begin that wilderness experience, that trial, that tribulation, they stay there. They, they build a house, they plant a vineyard, they plant a garden, and they stay in a wilderness. It's not God's will for you to stay in that wilderness. It's God's will to bring you through that wilderness. Church, I understand it's not easy. But as a believer, we count it all 
joy. That word joy means cheerfulness. I know it's hard to be cheerful in the midst of a storm. I know it's hard to have a smile when everything else is falling down around you. But that's when you know I'm not my own anymore. I don't have to go through this by myself. I am bought with a price. I have been purchased by God. I have been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ so that when I go through this trial, I've got God himself that will, help, that will hold me up in the palm and the power of his right hand that will lead me through that trial and tribulation. We count it all joy because we know God is not going to let us go. It may seem like he is a million miles away. It may seem that the heavens are shut. It may seem that our prayers fall to the ground. But trust me, every tear that you shed, every tear that falls upon your pillow is noted by our heavenly father and even though you may feel he's not there the word of god tells us otherwise that he will be will never leave us nor will he ever forsake us and he will stick with us closer than a brother we count it all joy because we know we're going through i'm going through i'm not staying where I am and because I know that when I go through whatever situation that is in front of me that I'm coming out stronger I'm coming out stronger you see the devil wants you to come out weaker but God wants you to come out stronger God wants you to come out of that trial or tribulation stronger than what you were before you went in and this is where we can grow discouraged, weary. Frustrated. Now I'm going to ask you a question. I don't want you to answer this publicly. But how many of you have ever said these words, "I feel like giving?" up I can't take it anymore I can't go through it but right at that moment start looking back at what God has brought you through Start looking back at the issues that he's brought you through, the trials that he's brought you through, the smaller tribulations, the smaller giants. Every one was to lead you to this moment because as you look back and say, God, you brought me through this. Lord, you brought me through that. Lord, you brought me through this situation. You brought me through that. Yes, I've got scars. Yes, I've been knocked down. Yes, I've been bloodied. But Lord, you brought me through it. You have been, you've been faithful whenever I wasn't. You've been right there with me whenever I wanted to quit and give up. You've held me and you've brought me through. Lord, if you can bring me through that, then I know you can bring me through this right here. If you brought me through this, I know you can bring me through this moment now. Count it all joy. Because we know he's not through with us yet. He's still working. He's still in control. This means that everything that you come against and everything you face is either caused by God or allowed by God to happen. But God is not doing this to be mean to you. Come on now. He's not doing this to be mean to you. He's doing it for a purpose. What is that purpose? Look at the next one. Knowing this, verse number three. James says, knowing this, meaning that what I'm about to tell you is going to come to pass, that the trying of your faith 
works patience. You're all familiar with this next statement. Faith must be tested. All faith must be tested. Great faith must be tested greatly. All faith, that's what the word, the trying of your faith, the testing of your faith. In other words, the very moment you get saved, the first few days feel like, man, it, you're, it's, a, it's, a, it's a miracle. I mean, you feel like you're on cloud nine. But eventually, there's going to come an attack. You see, as a child, when you go through grammar school, when you go through middle school, when you go through high school, when you go through college, there's always exams, tests, to see if you know the material. Tests are always given to see if you know the material at hand. If you don't know the material, what happens? You fail. And if you fail, more than likely, you're going to have to repeat it. Just like the Christian walk. But if you know the material as difficult as it is at times to remember to the, the, all the information that you need, but when you pass it, you move on to the next course, which is harder than the one you just came from. Likewise, as a believer, every test that you go through prepares you for the next one that is right ahead. It prepares you for the next trial, the next tribulation, the next thing that is coming. So all faith must be tested. It has to be proven. If it's not genuine, it comes out. But it has to be proven. You remember David, right before he went to face Goliath. Saul said, bring him back. Put my armor on him. And David put his armor on him, on himself. And David put that Saul's armor on himself. And yet he took it off because he said, it hasn't been proven. When you put on the, uh, the, 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 uh, the armor of something else, when you got saved, the armor of God was given to you and you put it on. That's been proven. That's been tested. That's been tried to come as true. But the very moment you take that armor off, spiritually speaking, and put something else on, it hasn't been tested. It hasn't been proven. So what happens? Suffer defeat. Let me go ahead and meddle on this for a moment. We've seen countless number of people I'm into this ministry. The message of the cross has changed their life, revolutionized their life. They're different. It has impacted them in a way that nothing else has impacted them. However, they don't understand, many of us, and I'm including myself in this. Because in my mindset, when I first understood the message of the cross, my mindset was very simple. Hey, I got it now. It's all gravy now. It's all good. But what I didn't understand was that whatever attacks that were there were just amped up to 11. Remember the children of Israel? The very mention of the sacrifice regarding their deliverance. Pharaoh said, not only am I not going to let you go, but we provided the materials for you to make the brick. You go out and find your own material. You go out and provide it. You've got to do it yourself now. And the workload was increased. The fire, the temperature was increased because Satan knows that's the answer. And he stop at nothing to move you away from that. How many 
when leveled with those, with those attacks. They falter. And they say these words. I guess the cross just doesn't work for me. I guess the cross doesn't work for me. I remember I've said that. It was on a Wednesday evening. There's two things about this that I want to share. It was a Wednesday evening about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. About ready to come to church. When I sat on the edge of my bed and I, I uttered those words, I said, God, I guess the cross doesn't work for me. It may work for others, but it doesn't work for me. That's when the Lord spoke to me. He said, son, do you want to be made free? Yeah. Then he answered and said, believe. What is he saying? No matter what comes your way, no matter what thoughts the devil puts in your mind, no matter what trials you may face and you feel defeated, just continue to believe. Continue to believe in what got you in. Continue to believe. And here's the second thing. In the midst of all of that, just a few days later coming to church and still trying to wrap my head around that statement, that, that, that meaning, just believe. My grandfather made a statement that completely changed my life. He said these words. He said, some of you have thought to yourself and said, the cross doesn't work for me. He said, no, the cross always works. It's us that don't work too well. When he said that, I thought to myself and said, you know what? He's right. The cross has never failed. The cross is always working. The cross will always work. It's me that won't work all the time very well. You see, my faith is not as strong as I think it is at times. Your faith is not as strong as you think it is at times. That's why you need to have the assurance to know that we've got to count it all joy that when we face these trials, no matter how many times they get knocked down, I'm getting up. I'm getting up like Muhammad Ali. Boy, I love that story. Papa, I don't know, he's told it maybe about a million times ever since that I can remember. But him fighting whatever, George Foreman, Sonny Liston, or whoever it was, one of those bad-to-the-bone boxers, and he laid him out with everything he had. I mean, connected with a right hook that broke Muhammad Ali's jaw. And he thought to himself, I got you. You see, some of you just like that, you had your jaw broken, spiritually speaking. And the devil is looking at it and said, I've got him. I've got him. I've got him. But when the referee moved, he's sitting in the corner. He's getting that mouthpiece changed. He said, I got him now. You can forget it. The title's mine. And he looked up and he saw Ali say, come on. Come on. Is that all you got? Is that all you got? Your mama hits harder than that. Come on. Is that all you got? Is that all? Come on. Just bring it. Just bring it. I'm not giving up. I'm not quitting. You may have knocked me down, but I am getting up. I'm getting up. He said this. Trying of your faith works patience. Patience there doesn't mean sitting and waiting. How many of you have ever gone to the doctor? Your appointment is at 1130. You show up at 11. Fill out your name. Fill out everything you got to fill out. 1115 rolls around. You got here early. How many times? I mean, you go to the doctor. It's like we all get there early thinking that he's going to call us early. <laughs> Every one of us. We'll get there at 9 o'clock because we think he's going to call us at 9 o'clock. Our appointment's at 1130. He ain't going to see you till 1130. Now, change that. Because 1130 is going to come and you're still waiting. Nowadays, you got cell phones. You can play games. You can talk to people. You can do whatever, you know, whatever you want to do. 1145 rolls around. You're still waiting. 12 o'clock, still waiting. 
12, 15, finally the nurse says, the doctor will see you now. That's a lie. <laughs> because you just go from one large waiting room to a small waiting room. <laughs> Come on. You get to that small waiting room, the nurse comes in, takes your blood pressure, asks you a few questions, then says, well, the doctor will be here in just a moment. You just said the doctor's ready to see me. And then at this time, what happens? Your patient starts to go very thin. And then finally, at about 1 o'clock, the doctor comes in. What's wrong? Well, da-da-da-da-da, and he just ignores you, looks at you, takes you this, does that, does that, signs a prescription, says, I'm out of here. Two mi- you waited two hours for two minutes. Some of you think, that well, that's patience. No, that is patience, and patience is a virtue, but that's not the patience we're talking about here. The patience that we're talking about here is endurance. It has to do with finishing a marathon, not sitting and waiting, but finishing the race that is before you. Paul said, run this race in patience. James is saying the same thing here, that whatever you go through in life, the trials of your faith, the testings of your faith will produce patience endurance to stand in the midst of the storms and when the devil is knocking you down you stand up and you have a look of determination in your eyes and in your spirit that says I've come too far to look back I've come this far. I'm not quitting now because my blessing is right ahead of me. My finish line is right ahead. I've come too far to quit. Miss Nancy Harmon, she wrote that song when she sang it the first time here at Family Worship Center. Even during the rehearsals, you can feel something. And when she began to sing with that, 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 that strong, powerful voice, I've come too far to look back. That started trickling out with some people thinking the devil's knocked me down. I feel like quitting. I feel like giving up. But the Holy Ghost said, ah, just get up. You've come too far to look back. I've brought you through this, that, and the other. It's too late. Keep pushing forward. God doesn't have a reverse button. He has a go forward button. He wants you to continue. He picks you up in this moment of despair and discouragement. For endurance for the rest of the journey home. I've got to quit. He said, but let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Some of you, this is exactly where you are. You're in this stage where you've been knocked to the ground. The Holy Spirit's telling you, you've blown it, or you think you've blown it, but you haven't. Just get up. Get your eyes back on me and let me have the ability to work in you. God's not through with you. You may have made made a mess of things, but he's not through with you. He will pick you back up and continue to mold you and make you into what he wants you to be. The anchor still holds. The ship has been battered. The sails have been torn. But that anchor still holds. If you can get that into your spirit, that the anchor is still holding, then he's going to bring you through. I've come too far to look back. I'm not quitting right here. 
I'm not giving up right here. I'm not stopping right here. God, you brought me through this sickness. You brought me through this disease. You brought me through this problem. You brought me through this pro- this situation. You brought me through this giant. You defeated that giant. You've knocked down this Jericho wall. You've done all of this, and yet I see a mountain that I can't cross. God is still in the mountain pushing down business. If you just continue to hold to that nail-scarred hand and believe that no matter what happens in life, I know my Lord is going to lead me out. I know my Lord's going to bring me through. I know my Lord's going to see me through. I've come to tell you, just when you feel like giving up, just when you feel like throwing a towel, this is the time the Holy Spirit is telling you, not yet. Not yet. Get up. You've come this way. You've come this far. I'm not giving up on you now. And if I'm not giving up on you, you better not give up on me. Because I'm not giving up on you. I'm not quitting. I know. Tomorrow comes. There's going to be another problem. Next week, another giant. Week after, another situation. Next year, a whole new batch of trials. That's when I need to look back and say, all the mountains that stood before me were just a hill from heaven's point of view that he'll bring you through if you don't quit and you don't give up. You've come too far to look back. He'll lead you the rest of the way home. Bow your heads, please. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. In the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you that you haven't given up on us yet and that you won't give up on us now. Whatever giants, whatever situations, whatever trials that we may be facing. God, I know that I've come too far to look back and that you're going to see me through the rest of the way home. I want everyone standing, everyone standing. If you're here this morning, I'm not trying to embarrass you, don't want to embarrass you, but if you're here this morning and you say, you know what, that's me. I feel like I'm on the verge of giving up and quitting. If that's you, I just want you to come down this front. I pray everyone in here is good, but if not, this is for you. This is your moment to say, Lord, I'm not giving up now. I'm not quitting now. If that's you, come on down to this front. Whatever they feel led to sing right now, just come on down. If you feel like you can't go any further, I believe the Holy Spirit's telling you, I've got this. Just trust me. Just trust me. Whatever you feel, let on singing. Just go on singing right now. I've come too far to look back.
open up right now. Places I know, but know that you're nearing that home shore. The redeemed, they are rejoicing. Heaven's angels are singing. They're still singing. One more time. Come on, just sing it one more time. Just start believing right now. too far to look back. I've come too far to give up. Everyone here and every one of you watching and listening, this is for you as well. Don't quit. He's brought you safe thus far. He will continue to bring you safe the rest of the way home. I want you to raise your hands right now and let's pray. I want those in the audience, stretch forth your hands to those, those that are watching and listening. Stretch forth your hands right now. Heavenly Father, we come before you. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, I'm asking and praying for every man, woman, boy, and girl under the sound of my voice. I pray strength would come right now. I pray deliverance would come right now. Lord, you have brought us this way. Lord, I'm asking that you would help us, give us strength and faith to continue to move forward. Have your way. In our hearts, have your way in our lives. And we rejoice knowing that you're not through with me yet. You're not through. We are not a finished product yet. But I pray that you administer to every person. Give them strength right now in this time of need. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Turn around and tell your neighbor you love them. Don't miss the service tonight. Six o'clock. Don't miss it. I've come to Hold a second. Hold. To Everybody, give me your attention real quick. Uh, we have to make a correction on one of the announcements. The funeral for Brother Venable Tuesday morning will not be in the sanctuary, but it will be in the Crossfire building. They've got some work going on here. So if you're coming for the funeral Tuesday at 11, it will be in the Crossfire building in the back. Hey, why don't y'all go by and introduce yourselves to our friends from Norway and shake their hand and welcome them into the church. Thank you for coming. We love you. What time is the service? It's 11 o'clock, I said. I've come too far to the place.